Well, so so it is with advertising. I mean, it's sort of a creative business, supposedly. But I'm staying with a friend at the moment. And one of the things about advertising, well, it's a confession. I'm making confessions to you now. I'm going to open my heart to you and my soul. And if you want to throw anything, you please do. But, um, but he said, one of the things he was watching television last night, and you observe this when you work in this business of advertising, you know. You observe, you say, well, like, oh, Christ, here comes the ads again, you know. I'll turn over to the channel. And uh, on obviously, it's sort of like, oh, no, not the ads again. You know, it's almost like this moment of torture during a, a period of what's supposed to be um, entertainment. There's this brief moment of, of interruption of hell. And that's called advertising. Well, I came across a quote by William Buffalo Yates the other day, which I, which I liked. I thought it was quite interesting. My mother was Irish, and, and I have quite a few Irish relatives, and, uh, and it, like, frankly, I find them absolutely delightful. They, um, they have tremendous compassion and thoughtfulness, and, 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 and they've all, when I was a kid, you know, they were always so kind to me. But anyway, this quote went, it's like, being Irish, he had an abiding sense of tragedy, which sustained him through brief periods of joy. And... Um, I'm sure William Butler but, but, like, but, 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 yeah, meant that to be funny. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the thing is that working in advertising, it, it's all sort of like, the thing is that there's an image of advertising as it, it almost to be a sort of glamorous, romantic, exciting world, which it is for a brief moments. But the other moments are agonizing, really quite agonizing hard work to try and search for a, an idea that's almost beyond you in a, in a time frame that's ridiculous under pressure but people pecking at your head continuously and that's you know what it's actually kind of really like and that's one of the reasons I wrote this little book here because it's it, it is it, while it's not long I think I've put things into it I think are kind of important for anyone who's interested in going into the advertising business now I don't think anyone here is, is I don't think any of you want to go into the advertising business I might be right there you past that stage in your life, you know. <laughs> but um, but, what, what, there are, but it is interesting, though. And what's interesting about it is, to me is, is, is that, you know, it's one, of the most, one of the reasons I wrote this is because I wanted to sort of put the inside story, in, as it were, about the advertising business, because in every, in every business, there's politics, of course, and there's tension, and there's rivalry and all of those sorts of things. But in the world of advertising, I think it's carried to the ultimate extreme. A friend of mine, has anybody seen uh, Mad Men here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, a friend of mine said, it was very popular, wasn't it, Mad Men? Really? But um, until it was surpassed by Breaking Bad, which in turn surpassed by Game of Thrones, now Mad Men seems sort of like timid, really, I suppose. But, but um, a friend of mine said to me, is Mad Men like, you know, I go back a bit, right? So is, is, is Mad Men really like advertising? What about really like advertising? Well, so not really, a, such and such, it's more like the Game of Thrones, uh, in a way, because at such and such, the, the politics was at its ultimate extreme. And I will tell you stories about that, but one of the guys, you, one of the things that's interesting about advertising, you do meet some really quite interesting people. And um, in the process of this, you know, people who, who are now quite well-known film directors, you know, guys who used to make TV commercials and become film directors, and guys who used to write ads and become writers and so on, and, and, uh, and I still do visual work. I started as an art director on the visual side of things, and then I, I changed to become a writer, as a matter of fact, because the reason for that was I thought a lot of ads that I was looking at were, were ill-written, and, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this business is one that assumes that everybody's talented and you're living in a world of supreme minds, you know. Well, it's actually quite disappointing on the other side when you get into it, really. I mean, and the other thing that surprised me, I come from, I come from Cheshire originally. Has any of you, anyone heard of Cheshire? <laughs> <laughs> well, I come from a, a little town called Bollington in Cheshire originally. And um, so I was sort of like a country boy, really, actually, and you know, work, working class parents, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, D.H. Lawrence was a 
working class or have. But for example, but but the thing is that with, you know you, when you when you're young, you, you idolize, you, you have this image, uh, I, at least I did, this image of people in business with their suits and their ties and their well-groomed manner, their, their, their flawless uh, uh, diction, uh, being, being brilliant at whatever they do. And then when I got, got involved into meetings, as a junior person, I was so shy, I was afraid of actually speaking for a long time, you know. And I didn't even say a word until I was 43. Now, that's hell my career, though. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, well, why, why, why am I failing? Because it's taught more. But um, the thing, interesting thing is, this: when I was in meetings, I found people saying things. I thought, that can be true, you just said that. You know, I mean, like, you know, you hear outrageously ridiculous things said in business that, that you know, you, you, you find absolutely absurd. Now, I wish I could remember some of them. <laughs> but there are too many almost to remember. But there's like funny stories that I mean, you might have relate to funny story to you. All right. I mean, like when you're writing, see, like you know, like for TV commercials, for example. The crazy thing about it is that you work and work and work hard with your colleagues, of course, to come up with so-called great ideas. Now, they may be or may not be great. But you obviously, obviously do your best. Now, I think that one of the things I wrote this thing was for this reason. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging to you. you know? I don't want to sound, sound, sound like I'm bragging. But I do, honestly, the ads I've generally worked on, in, in all media, you know, print, and television, and radio, and so on and so forth, have actually been very, very, very successful. Sometimes so success, successful that the client has been stunned and amazed. I mean, I worked on, uh, for example, I worked um, on a biscuit board somewhere. I launched these biscuits, and there was, there was a launch, the product that didn't exist before, and the sales rocketed over, and when the, 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 the ad ran, right, right. and the sales rocketed immediately. But they weren't very good biscuits, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, 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 <laughs> then people tasted them. <laughs> and the client then turns on you. you know, and it's not the product's fault. The advertising's been too good. Sorry about that. How oh, good, how oh, bad you want me to make it? You know, it's, it's not a decision, you know. But that's what happens, you know. You, you, know, you always get the blame. And that's life. But um, I must tell you, see, I have always been, it's just true to say, I'm, uh, 10 years ago, probably as, as little as eight years ago, rather than talk to you guys here, and if I may say so, you, as I look across at your faces, I've never seen such a range of, 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 of highly refined and intelligent people in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been what to this point. Who cares who you support Tottenham? You know? <laughs> but, but, you know, the thing is that there was a time when I would have actually dug a hole with my bare hands in the ground and buried myself in, inside that hole rather than talk to people. And it's true enough. And I used to be a nervous wreck going into meetings, you know. It's my turn to talk. And, you know. And over time, you sort of overcome it, I suppose. Oh, yes. oh, and then eventually, you, you, and I, what's happened with me as well, I, I sort of like found an ability to, to actually be quite persuasive. And I was working with a guy who worked at Satchi for 17 years, and I did a presentation once with him. It's only about four years ago, yeah, five years ago. Mm -hmm. A presentation to Toyota, and I was doing all their ads for the year, right? It went on for 90 minutes of hard work, you know, present, presenting this stuff. And when he came out, he paid me a wonderful compliment. He said, that was a masterclass in presentation. And I looked around and then realized he was talking to me, you know. I mean, so I just showed you how, how, how self-demeaning we can be and how, how lacking in confidence we can be. And um, I'm just mentioning this because if any of you have children, and some of you probably already have, um, that's one of the worst things you can do with kids, I think, is, 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 is put them through what I went through as a kid, which is you can't do anything worth doing, you know. Yeah. 
because it's too fancy and snancy and, and all this kind of business. And, you know, well, my dad was a factory worker, you know, so I want, to, I want to go to art school, you know, what's that? <laughs> but, um, but they did their point, though. I mean, you've got to really, I think, I think that it's self-evident. You, you, you've usually got to try and believe in yourself, and it's not always easy, but that's what you've got to do. Now, on that very point, I just said a little story, so do you mind if I tell you a story? Um, of course, this creative director's uh, conferences, that, well, they used to happen now, people are too tired to pay for them anymore, but you, you, around the world, you used to find yourself in places like Florence and Rome and so on and so forth, and all the creative directors would used to fly in, and there'd be, um, there'd be you know, heavyweights talking at these conferences. And uh, I don't know that any of you have heard of Elmick Newton, perhaps you've heard of Elmick Newton, yeah, Elmick Newton. So, world top, top photographers of the history of photography. And Elmick Newton was giving a talk at this conference, along with Spike Lee, the film director, and, and some other heavy dudes, you know. And this was in Florence, at, uh, it was a big deal, and that's actually this. And, and we were all we arrived in Florence, and, and all the creative directors of this hotel. And there, it's lunch, we we're going to have, have a lunch at this posh restaurant. And at a certain point, at about 12, 30, whatever. And so I arrived at this foyer of this restaurant, the area outside the restaurant, early. And I saw this, and I loved Elmick Newton's photography. I mean, he's wonderful. I always thought he was a wonderful photographer. But I wasn't new, Albert Newton, if I was, well, you know, I wasn't the one that didn't what he looked like. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, as, we, as I was like hanging about, and you know, sort of, sort of like hanging about looking at these sort of tapestries and stuff in this posh restaurant in the, in Florence, and there's this other guy who you know, arrived early as well. And I, you know, being stupid, and I, uh, you know, I've never lost my stupidity even over the years. And so I went up to him and said, he said, I, are you with the conference? He said, yes. I said, he said, I said uh, oh, I'm John. And she said, I'm Elmer. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you, you must be, uh, you must, Elmer, you must be from either, uh, I suppose Austria or Germany. <laughs> 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 BBDO said, Oh, I don't work for BBDO. I said, All oh, right. Well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> he said, Well, I take snacks. I said, All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, it dawned on me, you know. <laughs> I think I told you already, I come from Bollington. Right? <laughs> um, and it dawned on me. I said, Well, look, you're Ellen Newton. He said, Well, guilty, he says, right. So then we have a talk. and. Other people are so excited to mingle around. But we got, actually got on very well. I had an interesting conversation about photography and, and, and Florentine art and this and the other. They seem to know about this sort of thing. It's quite surprising. And um, <laughs> so, um, and then she said to me, just to say, said, Do you mind if I join you at the table for lunch? I said, Be my guest. So we sat together and we were talking at lunchtime. And then just as it was ending, the lunch was ending, we had a great time. There were other people at the table as well. Session, no. and he said, Joe, would you do me a favour? Almost, you know, for, for, as a whisper, you know, do you do me a favour? I thought, what, what, what on earth can this be? I said, well, if I can. He said, well, I'm giving a talk about three o'clock this afternoon. Are you at home? He said, and you'll be in the audience. I said, yeah. He said, well, there's always this moment at the end of an the talk that can be embarrassing or difficult. He said, because at the end of the end, when I finish giving a talk, he said, I always ask, has anyone got any questions? And if, if it's complete silence, it's so, so awkward. He says, so if no one asks a question, would you mind asking me one? And that's, I thought that's amazing because I thought, here's Elmer Newton, right? The legendary Elmer Newton asking me, <laughs> you know, humble old people, 